As soon as he was old enough, Trevor Tors went to work at the same place as his dad. You went in, you done your job, and it was a, it was a good job. But this job would cost him and thousands of others very dearly. I was sort of listening to see if he's breathing properly, if he doesn't toss and turn or get really worried, and I'd touch him to see if he's still alive. Without doubt, this is the worst industrial disaster that has ever befallen this country. Tonight, Four Corners goes to the valley that once had so much promise, where people are proud and won't lie down, even if death may not be far away. The great city of Melbourne is waking up. A city of lights, trams, and over a million homes housing three and a half million people. Today, like every other day, it's hungry for electricity. The city sucks in enormous amounts of this energy power that surges through wires from a nearby valley. A hundred and sixty kilometres east of Melbourne, in between cattle farms and forests, are the giant cooling towers of La Trobe Valley's electricity stations. It's from here that Victorians have drawn their power since the early 1920s, when the state launched into large-scale electricity production. World War I hero, General Sir John Monash, was chosen to head the newly formed State Electricity Commission of Victoria. The reputation of the man was such that experienced men who were at virtually the peak of their own industrial careers, they wanted to come and work with Monash on this project. Under Monash, the SECV carved a huge open-cut coal mine out of the bush, and next to the mine built the Yalorn A power station. It opened for business in June 1924. Yalorn A was followed by B, C, D and E, which together formed a massive power station. The town of Yalorn was also built. Designed by the Electricity Commission's architect, it was purpose-built for power industry workers and their families. Yalorn was a model town, with its tree-lined streets, churches, cinema and schools. Yalorn was lovely. Yalorn was like the cultural and recreational and design gem of La Trobe Valley. It was beautifully laid out, there were beautiful amenities, the housing was very good quality. Nearby towns like Mowie and Morwell also expanded as workers poured into the Latrobe Valley to take up jobs in the power industry. Maybe not a worker's paradise, but it wasn't too bad. A vibrant working class culture grew. All this thanks to the State Electricity Commission. With the Mall Citizens Band, it's been around since 1887, which uh... Over a hundred years? Yes, for, almost from the, from the founding of the, of the town of Moorwall. I joined the band uh, in, uh, well, 20 years ago, say the 1980s. Uh, all, all the adult members, with perhaps one exception, were SEC employees.
To give somebody like me, an engineer, the job of being in charge of a power station was like giving a, a kid a giant Meccano set to play with. It was great stuff. Most of the people you knew worked at the SEC. And, and you, you had functions, you know, you go in on Saturday nights to, to different functions through the SEC put on, different balls and um, uh, just different nights out. And you, you did, you took a lot of pride in being, being an SEC worker. They thought this would go on for generations. The children of power station workers felt the same. In the Latrobe Valley, you could imagine a future. Well, uh, I just cruise around the streets like a young bloke normally does <laughs> on, a, on a Saturday, Saturday afternoon, Saturday night. And, uh, and uh, I've seen this girl walking around and I sort of chat her up. And, <laughs> and that's how we, we met. We started going out together. Gab, what was he like when you first met him? Um, well, <laughs> a little roughy. <laughs> but no, we got along fine. He was a one and only for me. We went together for around four years. We got married and lived happily ever after, and now it's nearly been 30 years. But from the mid-1960s, worrying stories were being told. Some men were not as well as they should have been. I used to travel home with a chap on the Pasty Law North. And he used to cough and cough and cough, cough. And I said, what's wrong with you, Bill? He said, I don't know. You know 30 years later, the warning signs would be the same. Uh, walking around the, the mountains, uh, the young blokes started to catch up to me. And I wanted to know why, you know, I, I just couldn't, uh, I thought it must have been old age, but no, me, me lungs were hurting, they were, they were they going over time, yeah. When her husband Arnold collapsed in the shower, Faye Needham knew something was wrong. Oh, often in the shower, and, and as soon as you pull the shower curtain, the steam, he just claps to the floor. Big, and it anyway. had, uh, yeah. Only way you can breathe is on the floor. No. Whether it's lack of oxygen, the heat of the shower, or, or what, but it just really churned the lungs up. And it does on most of the people. They they find that the shower is the it's the worst place out. In 1998, I uh, I was w walking around, working around, and I was getting short of breath. And we thought we'd better go to the doctor and find out why I'm getting short of breath. And I had an X-ray, um, and found it a cloud on me, me lung. When the SEC built your lawn power station, it needed a way to control the extreme heat in electricity generation, some form of insulation. It chose the miracle substance asbestos. It was used as lagging around pipes, for gaskets in between pipes, for the walls and for roofs. It was a wonder product. It was a preferred product for, in all sorts of situations. And, and people just didn't want to stop using it uh, in, in terms of, you know, major manufacturing processes. It's a very wonderful chemical, asbestos. It's fireproof. Uh, it, it, it insulates. It, it, uh, it's acidproof. It does wonderful things. It's only got one failing. It kills people. It kills people, and asbestos-caused deaths and disease were being officially reported to the British Parliament as far back as 1930. But the warnings soon came much closer to home. Four Corners has obtained internal SECV documents dating back to the 1940s, warning of the dangers of asbestos in the Alorn power station. In November 1944, Dr Douglas Shields from the Victorian Health Department toured the power station. He warned about the presence of asbestos, which he said causes fibrosis of the lungs. 
he said asbestos was one of the most harmful dusts. Dr Shields recommended medical examinations of the men who were exposed to asbestos for some considerable period. But the Electricity Commission rejected the proposal, writing that a medical examination is a matter for the employees themselves. The SEC were probably being warned by somebody who was a generation ahead of his time. And because you're talking about big money, the question is, how much notice do you take of an aberrant opinion well, over a, any given matter? This is a doctor from the Victorian Health Department. Yes. That doesn't necessarily uh, mean that... Uh, that he was necessarily convincing. In the years that followed, this creeping killer was coming loose from pipes and wafting through the cavernous Yalorn power station, a huge moving, shaking machine. Many thousands of workers were being exposed. If you get a blade of light coming through a window and you look up and that light shining and you see all this dust, it's just... Uh, you can still do it on early mornings sometimes in places where the light, the beam of light shines. And uh, and what was that dust? It was asbestos. Laying there, yeah, it was just there, you know. It was yeah. everywhere. It was just like, uh, it was snowing at times. Well, I, I remember with, with my father, um, when he used to sit there and he used to have his, his coffee, It, it'd be floating down like like snow, virtually like snow. And he'd have his cup of coffee and he'd be wiping it off the top of his coffee to drink his, his coffee. One thing that happened uh, in the initiation of junior people there, uh, they were thrown in a, a vat of liquid asbestos. And I believe that this was uh, not an uncommon, uncommon occurrence. <laughs> And people would have just thought this was funny, I suppose. Oh, yes, true. Hilarious. Someone get out all dripping white, uh, gooey stuff off them. Uh, everyone thought that was hilarious. Mm. Arnold Needham worked in the power industry for 30 years from 1952. Seven years ago, he had a lung biopsy to test for asbestos exposure. The doctors found he had the first signs of asbestos-induced sickness. Following complications from the surgery, he lost his kidneys and both legs. So you'll be on this for four and a half hours? All right? Yep, no worries. Now Arnold has to have dialysis three times a week and he and Faye worry he may have carried asbestos out of the power station, exposing others. And you come yeah. straight home to the kids yeah. in the night, wouldn't you, and cut, you know, give yeah, the kids no, a no kiss and they go? nothing. We didn't no, think. No, no, nothing. No, no, yeah. I mean, if you know now, you'd come home, you'd shower first and get rid of that lot, but we weren't yeah. told that, and we yeah. used to go to meet Dad, you know, and they'd all race up and jump all over him. And he'd be covered in asbestos? Yes. A kiss and a death sentence well, in the one in game. Your hair, you wouldn't. Then there were the many thousands of Victorian school kids who toured your lawn power station on excursions. The Queen even visited once. The number of those potentially exposed to asbestos here is almost too high to calculate. At La Trobe's Regional Respiratory Service, lung function tests to identify asbestos sickness are in high demand. Now take a maximum breath in, right in, 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 and right out, out, out. Breathing in asbestos can cause three main diseases, and they all attack the lungs. Asbestosis, lung cancer and mesothelioma. The mildest form, asbestosis, is still potentially deadly. It's created by scar tissue filling up the lungs. And relax. Mouthpiece out. 
for people who have asbestosis, which is a fibrotic scarring of the lungs due to asbestos, the main symptoms are persisting and worsening shortness of breath and cough. And that can lead eventually to shortness of breath that's so severe as to be respiratory failure. For people... And you would die from that? You can die from that. Uh, this one is a lung cancer. <coughs> then there's lung cancer, and most deadly of all, mesothelioma. In 1960, a now famous paper was published in the British Journal of Industrial Medicine, revealing the association between asbestos and mesothelioma. It stated that mesothelioma occurs 20 to 40 years or more after exposure to dust. Uh, for example, this is, uh, for reference, this is a normal lung, normal human lung, uh, it's a left lung, two lobes, nice pink uh, uniform texture. These are the normal markings of the uh, airways or bronchial tubes. Um, compare this to this, which is a specimen of a uh, malignant mesothelioma. This is the classical tumour that's pretty well always related to asbestos. This is a tumour of the malignant tumour or cancer of the lining of the lung, the outside lining of the lung. Mesothelioma doesn't tend to spread as widely in the body as lung cancer. It tends to kill people by spreading directly around the chest, constricting the lungs and causing increasing shortness of breath, increasing chest pain and loss of weight and debility and often a final event such as pneumonia. And once you diagnose somebody with mesothelioma, how long do they have to live? It's very variable and it's very difficult to prognosticate with certainty, but only a minority will live past a year and only a very small minority will live past two years. Did it surprise you that you had mesothelioma? Very surprised. Shocked. I was very shocked. Shocked the wife and the wife and the family. They were very, very, very distraught and very upset over it. Yeah. It's a very hard thing to, to, to accept when the doctor tells you that you've only got a few months, or you've possibly got a few months, to live. There may be some doubt in earlier cases whether management fully understood the dangers of asbestos. But by the time Trevor Tors went to work at Yalorn, the evidence was clear. Trevor didn't start working there until 1971, the same year that one of the SEC's managers returned from the UK with documents saying that asbestos causes mesothelioma. The report from the South of Scotland Electricity Board said that in a few rare instances a serious form of chest disease mesothelioma may occur many years after only a short initial exposure to asbestos dust it must therefore be assumed that any inhalation of asbestos dust carries some risk we all became alarmed and concerned about the death link that seemed to be looming between exposure to asbestos and mesothelioma, which I understand medical science still can't cure. And, and when was that, that alarm that you're talking about? It was the late 60s, early 70s. Trevor Tors? Okay. Hi, have a seat. Trevor Tors will die from mesothelioma. That's your latest one. That's the one before that. And I guess it's fair to say that there's not a lot of difference between those, although I think you'd have to say that there's a little bit more tumour tissue in there. In there than there was in there and that there was in there. Even if you allow for the differences in the quality and technical aspects of the x-rays, there's a bit of tumour growth there. It's not fast, uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh, but just a touch there, and that's probably why you're getting Can the, you get extra, the extra pain. Yeah. Uh -huh. The left lung still looks good. It still looks very clear. 
and the top two thirds of the right lung are still looking okay at present. Very good. Trevor contracted the disease at a time when his bosses knew of the direct link between asbestos and this horrible cancer. In the power station, asbestos was mixed up in wet form and applied to pipes as insulation. This was called lagging. While the laggers who put it on and took it off were especially vulnerable, they weren't the only ones exposed to asbestos. Where we worked, uh, say it was lagging around the pipes, sometimes it'd break off and fall down onto, onto the, the, the footpath or the, the walkway we are. And we used to pick it up and throw it at each other and kick it around like a football and, and, and stuff like that. So, and we just didn't know where it was. We, we didn't know it was asbestos at the time. We just thought it was uh, lagging around pipes and we just play with it. Even, even make your bad night shifts, you, you, you'd even get an asbestos bag where they've had asbestos in and you'd shake it out to make a, a little bed to lay down on and you'd, you'd lay on that. And you didn't know that this was deadly stuff? And we, didn't know that was, we did not know it was, was uh, at home in any way. In 1948, in the shadow of the Hammersley Range, a town was born. A town which in four years has grown to be the largest inland town in the north of Western Australia, Wittenoom. The dangers of asbestos are now well documented. 13 years ago, Four Corners reported on the terrible asbestos mine in Wittenoom. The following year, we showed the danger of asbestos in common house building products. Now there's a post-industrial nightmare unfolding in parts of Australia where asbestos sickness has been contracted in plants and factories. And when just about an entire region's workforce is exposed to asbestos for more than 60 years, it cuts a swathe through the community. To get an idea of how asbestos has affected the Latrobe Valley, take this street for example. One in four houses has had someone killed by asbestos. Imagine if you walked down your street and in every fourth house, one of your neighbours had died from the same deadly substance. And locals say this street's not that unusual around here. The young girl across the road's lost her dad and her mum. The chap next door and over the back here, he's affected by it. A friend a few doors down has lost the husband. Uh, another one over the road here, so they've left the, shifted from here now, but he shifted because he was sick with asbestos. Another chap just up three, four doors up has lost his dad and there's a couple of others over the road here that are really sick with it but you know still hanging in there yeah without doubt this is the worst industrial disaster that has ever befallen this country um, there is nothing to compare with it that sounds a little strong well it's meant to because it's true lawyer steve plunkett has lived in the latrobe valley for almost 20 years he's a partner at litigation activists slater and gordon and has seen many of his clients die. Um, I'm only one lawyer in the area, uh, and I would have uh, anything up to 100 to 200 uh, a year, uh, people suffering disease. What, 200 clients a year suffering mm. from asbestos? Asbestos-related diseases, yes. And the, the vast majority of those, terminal. Whether or not the SEC provided sufficient warnings and safety equipment to its staff is in dispute. Colin Harvey was safety engineer at Yalorn in the early 1970s and went on to be acting superintendent of the power station. He says safety precautions were certainly put in place throughout this period. We, we provided them with the gear. Uh, we provided them with everything from masks and goggles and, and overalls and uh, all of the stuff that uh, was meant to protect them. But there would always be quite a few who would rebel against that sort of coercive environment that said, you must wear this, you must protect yourself. Why would they do that? I think it was to do with uh, personality, um, what I would call the Australian psychological mentality where there's no identification, particularly when you're young, with any sense of mortality that anything you're going to do now, if it didn't uh, 
lop your finger off now or whatever. Um, all this talk about long-term stuff, it won't happen to me. Well, I'll ask you this. If I said to you, you put a mask on or in 30 years' time you, you, you might die the most terrible death that uh, you can ever imagine, uh, I, I reckon most people would put a mask on. The SECV argues that it did its best given the knowledge of the day. Yeah, that's indeed the argument they've been uh, running for the last 20 years. It would hasn't so succeeded yet. Uh, in fact, it's uh, never been accepted by any court. Um, and uh, certainly, uh, from my own knowledge, um, it's a nonsense. They didn't. Nobody told us anything about asbestos in those days. No, no warnings at all about it? No, no warnings, no. What about, did anybody have any protective gear, masks, for example? No, no, no masks, no, 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 no goggles, no, no, nothing. Nobody's told us anything about asbestos. What we do know is that the SEC's records show that management at Yalorn reacted to the news that asbestos causes mesothelioma with a series of meetings and referrals and committees. This went on for two and a half years until there was a meeting between the SECV and union members. Minutes of the meeting show union delegates concerned. They'd heard of the inherent dangers of asbestos. They claimed that in the building industry, masks and gloves were necessary. They were shown an SEC code of practice on safe handling of asbestos. None of them had seen it before. Again, this was two and a half years after managers definitely knew that asbestos causes mesothelioma. John Druitt was a senior manager at the SECV. He was safety manager, chaired the asbestos task force, and as personnel manager was responsible for all employees in the Latrobe Valley. Today, as a consultant to the SECV, he's the last of the old managers left. Lawyers for asbestos victims negotiate directly with Mr Druitt. As the public face of the SECV in the valley, he lives with a legacy of asbestos. And the industry, um, typically, when you use the word asbestos, thought of people who were called laggers, who did that and nothing else. So, given that from 1971 onwards, it was known that there was a direct link between asbestos and a horrible death from mesothelioma, do you think that the warnings to workers were sufficient? Well, I've heard a lot of people say we were never warned, but many of them were never involved with asbestos. So that the... But everybody in the power station was exposed. Everybody in an urban environment had exposure to very low qualities of asbestos. Surely so that's not the same as working in a power station where there were descriptions of clouds of asbestos moving around the plant. Have you got your next question? Uh, I'm sorry, but what do you mean by that? If there are people throughout the whole plant who are exposed to asbestos and you know that this could cause a horrible death to them, do you think that the workers, all the workers, were warned enough? You're not able to answer that for us? I think we're moving into a, a personal judgment area and I've got my views and uh, I don't think this is the area to uh, open them up. So I think we might call it quits at that point. Oh. Thanks very much. Mr Drewitt, you can't tell us if you think that the warnings were good enough? I mean, a lot of people died there and you're saying that you can't tell us if the warnings were good enough to them. At 52 years of age, Trevor Tors is too young to be dying. Today, mesothelioma affects just about all aspects of his family's life. We don't have sex at all. You just can't do it. No. And he's frightened. He gets very frightened because he can't, he sort of loses his breath. When you, when you, when you lose your breath, when you, you fight for your, actually fighting for breath at times, it's very hard, even just doing your lawns, but even when it, it comes like your sex life at the night time, you know you can't do it. You run out of breath and you just, um, and that's just one of the, 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 the other ways that sort of affect our life a lot. Yep. And does it also 
I suppose, um, hurt your, your pride or something in that way? Do you know what I mean? Well, well, you're not a man. Like, you know, you're, you're, a man's a man. You go and you... A man goes to work. A man does the lawns. Uh, a man, yeah, yeah, sex-wise, yeah. A man does that. And, of course, to me, you're, you're not a man. It, you, you get very, very down. It does. It hurts you that way, a lot, a lot of ways. It doesn't worry the wife. She accepts it. I'm, I'm lucky I've got an understanding wife. But it, uh, it, does, it does affect me in that way. I think about it a lot. 1998, I was... Um, working for a bread company and uh, running short of breath. So I decided to, to go to the doctor and see what's going on. And I was diagnosed with uh, mesothelioma, which is going to give me between three and nine months at the time. And Trevor and Gail have joined a bunch of unlikely activists who make up the Gippsland Asbestos-Related Diseases Support Network, or GUARDS. And some of those supervisors, like uh, Power Station Superintendent, the same disease has caught up with him and he's uh, deceased today. So uh, this asbestos doesn't escape anyone. And that we find really The group is lobbying for a complete ban on asbestos importation into Australia. And it wants employers who used asbestos to pay for education campaigns. And even le in the latter stages, we had people getting up at our safety meetings and saying, look, there's been some discussion about asbestos. Don't worry, trust us. Guards members also yeah, offer each other a good deal of moral support. If anybody has ever witnessed seeing a loved one die through not being able to breathe and going through what my husband did, um, they would understand why people feel disappointed that it wasn't recognised as a dangerous element to work with. My husband lost the battle just four months ago, so it's still pretty raw. Yeah, what name? The SEC has paid compensation to thousands of its ex-employees. Until recently, there was a mad rush to get things finalised before a worker died. That's because if you died before finalising your settlement, your family received greatly reduced compensation. In this area, Guards has already had a victory. Well, I think it was a hideous situation because um, pain and suffering compensation would not be payable if an asbestos sufferer died before the matter was settled. Now, um, I thought this was totally inappropriate and we changed the law. Uh, yes, in fact, but lawyers like Steve Plunkett can foresee other legal problems and want more legislation. One of the, one of the problems with this sort of litigation is that uh, your witnesses uh, are dying all the time. And, uh, I mean... I've got a list here of the uh, last, what, about a year or so of, of clients. And, uh, I mean, just all going... potential witnesses. All potential witnesses. But uh, going through this, I can tell you here and now. He's died. He's died. Uh, he's died. Died, died. The SEC has lost every asbestos case bar one. But with witnesses dying, Steve Plunkett says it'll become increasingly difficult for workers to prove exposure to asbestos. Died. Died. Now he wants the state government to make an overarching acceptance of exposure on behalf died. of the died. SEC. Died. I think uh, a blanket admission that if you worked uh, at, say, Hazelwood, Moorville Power Station, your lawn ABCD, your lawn W, certain periods, then it is a given that you're exposed to asbestos. The State Attorney-General seems reluctant to go down this path. This is not my area, right? I, I understood I was talking about dust, the, the dust disease legislation. This is a work cover area. It's a legal point. They're saying they're running out of witnesses. Yeah, but you're asking me to give legal advice. No, 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 that's no, no. Not I'm wondering how the government would, you know, if the government would consider making such an acceptance, because if the government um, yeah, if the government doesn't make such an acceptance, who would? How do they get that sort of a blanket? But again, I, look, this is the first time this has been raised with me, you know? Sure. Like, this is the first time it's been raised. It hasn't been raised by any lawyers acting for asbestos victims, with me personally, has never been raised. It hasn't been raised in any submission presented to me. So you're asking me to com comment on a hypothetical situation. And it, it, it's a cross-portfolio area. It's not just Attorney-General, it's in the main a work cover area.
Why can't you consider it without them coming to you, though? I mean, if I'm asking you about it now. B because it hasn't been put to me before this. I mean, you're saying people have spoken to you about this particular issue. Um, I have met with uh, these groups and it has never been raised with me by their lawyers or anybody else. Steve Plunkett says he has mentioned this proposal to Rob Hulls in person. People in the Latrobe Valley have seen drastic changes, especially in Yalorn town. Adding to the injury of asbestos sickness was the insult of taking the town away. It turned out Yalorn was built on top of the coal seam. The SEC decided to mine it and the town had to go. There were spirited protests. I am not convinced beyond reasonable doubt. And I do not believe that you can be convinced beyond reasonable doubt that the decision of the State Electricity Commission to put the bulldozers through your lawn is a just or a proper decision. But the residents lost and families who'd lived in your lawn for six decades were moved out. By the mid-1980s, your lawn was gone. Throughout the 1990s, the Latrobe Valley was rocked again. The SECV was dismantled, the power industry privatised and thousands of jobs shed. The local economy collapsed and today unemployment is around 14%. Youth unemployment is many times that. Ever since then the area has struggled. The signs of economic downturn are everywhere to be seen. Then there's the old power station itself. It was finally switched off in 1989, and two years ago, it was destroyed using explosives. Hello, hello. Go. Not gonna go. go. <laughs> Here she goes. Here goes. Here goes. Here goes. Here goes. Here goes. I don't think it went where it was supposed to go. <laughs> Unions claim the clouds of dust that accompanied the explosions could have contained asbestos, endangering nearby houses and also the many spectators who turned out to watch the blowdown. <laughs> Fuck, here it comes. Isn't it? Is it ever? <laughs> Given the nature of the project that it was, the extent of the asbestos in a very old power station mixed together with heavy demolition, I don't think anybody could uh, guarantee that all of the asbestos was stripped out prior to uh, the buildings being toppled. And given the age of this power station and the mix of demolition with asbestos, it was improper to use explosives. Management filmed asbestos being removed from the demolition site but Dave Pillar says he's sure that all the asbestos was not removed from the power station prior to the blowdown. That's because he photographed scrap metal that was taken from the demolition site and left in a nearby yard. We looked and inspected the, the wire compound, the open wire compound where around about three to 4,000 tonnes of scrap steel was stored in big lumps. And visually you could see uh, pieces of asbestos and asbestos-related uh, products. So you saw that in, asbestos? Yes, I saw that and I took photos of that. Victorian unions have asked WorkCover to examine the blowdown, but the state government department says it's satisfied all the asbestos was removed. A spokesperson from Work Cover told Four Corners, any issues that have been raised have been investigated and righted.
And now the State Electricity Commission doesn't even exist. It was dismantled following power industry privatisation. Only a small office remains to look after outstanding matters like asbestos compensation. The power industry remains in the Latrobe Valley at sites like the new privatised Yulorn W power station. But the great engineering vision of Sir John Monash has left a ghostly presence and a bitter taste. The old Yulorn power station has gone. The town of Yulorn has gone. The State Electricity Commission has gone. And thousands of workers have gone many dying from a preventable disease that caught them when they were working. Come back and get yeah, well, we'll have to get out. I'm not going down the street. No. No. Too, I'm too but those who are left certainly aren't going to give up easily. Good. Oh. You're going down the street? No, no, no I later I will. Yep, I'll have, uh, I'll we'll have a run and double in Maui. I'll take uh, King Island that and good. Dennis McGregor's horse. Read that. You're right, so what you've got one there, and I'll 11. go down and do that for yeah. you after. Yeah, that only um, cost me two, that cost me three dollars. Some were even told they should have died a long time ago, but they just don't seem to get the message. Well, I asked my doctor and he, he, he says, um, when you've got mesothelioma, your lifespan is between three and nine months. And I said to the doctor, I said, well, I'm going to last nine months. So I, you know, I've got a lot. He said, I didn't say that. He says, your lifespan is between three and nine months. So we, we just, we didn't know how long I had. And how long ago was that now? That was 19, it was June 98. It's more than two years ago. So it's two years ago, so something's gone right there, <laughs> which is good. To what you, do you attribute your you know, apparent good health at the moment? I don't really know. I just... good luck. Positive thinking. Positive thinking. I think it'll make him go a lot longer yet. Because he's just... thinks positive. He thinks rea like the reality side of us as well, but he just... Oh, we'll go here, we'll go there. Next couple of months, maybe I might be able to get on a holiday and... And that's sort of what keeps us both going. Otherwise, I think we'd just both go downhill. And he keeps me thinking positive as well. So we still have laughs. We still enjoy oh, life, like what we've do. got left. Yeah, well, I don't know. I just don't throw the towel in. I, I try and battle as best I can. Try and be, be humorous. Try and just try and forget us there, if possible. Although it's very hard when you, you've got pain. I'm in pain, constant pain. I'm taking painkillers every day for, for the pain. But I just um, put the back of my head so I'll bug you, I'm gonna live for a lot longer. And I just go on with, with life and just just treat life like that. Plus you you gotta you wake up every morning and you see your wife next to you and you say, Well that's a that's a good start. That's a real good start. This is Stephen McDonnell inviting you to join our online discussion from 9.30 tonight Eastern Daylight Saving Time. Go to abc.net.au slash four corners and follow the links to the forum.